The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in that chapter which we read at the beginning, the third chapter of the book of Exodus, reading again verse 6. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. I want particularly to deal with this great statement. I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now this is one of these great foundational statements, one of those statements which is vital and absolutely essential to an understanding of the Christian faith. It's a phrase that you will find repeated frequently in the Old Testament and in the New. That is why I say it is one of those basic and fundamental statements. And if we are not clear about this, obviously the whole of our position will be affected by that. It's a statement, as I want to try to show you, that is of great importance for the individual. It is also of great and crucial importance for the church, the gathering, the collection of God's people. And all that is put before us here in a very interesting manner. We find that what happened here was of inestimable value and worth to Moses as an individual. But it is still more significant and important uh, with respect to the nation of Israel of which Moses became the appointed leader. Now, let's look at this together, and do so particularly in the light of its setting. The historical setting is not only interesting, but it's uh, very important for us if we are to learn the full lesson of what happened here, and above all, the pregnant meaning of this great statement this great assertion. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. You remember the setting. Moses, this extraordinary man, this brilliant man, this man who had been brought up as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, this man who, according to tradition, was greatly endowed with gifts in a military sense and in governmental sense, the men who could have been the chief men in the land of Egypt. He's here as just a shepherd. He'd had to escape for his life from Egypt, and he'd had to leave all the glamour and the pomp and the ceremony of the court. And here he is performing one of these most menial of all tasks, especially as it was regarded in those times. His circumstances then, I say, were not only low, but they were very discouraging. And he'd been there for some 40 years or so. There he is then in this humble and humiliating condition and position. And the same was true of his people. He'd had to escape for his life because of his concern for his people, the children of Israel. They were down in Egypt. In the days of Joseph, they'd had a wonderful time there, but another king arose who knew not Joseph, another generation came, and the children of Israel were in a condition of bondage and of captivity, badly treated, derided and persecuted, and in an apparently hopeless state and condition. They had no arms, there was no possibility of their working up some kind of a rebellion and making their escape. The whole condition was one of utter dejection and of utter hopelessness. That, you see, was the position of Moses himself and the people to whom he belonged. The position seemed one of unrelieved gloom and darkness and hopelessness and despair. But, and this is the whole point, though it appeared like that to human eyes, that is not really the truth about the position. God does something. And this is the thing which we are going to study and consider together uh, this morning. 
Here is an answer to all that, and it is the only answer. And it is still the same answer and still the only answer. And that is why I say all this is so important for us. This in many ways can be described as the great message of the Bible. The Bible comes to a world of sin and shame and failure. And it comes, breaks in with this great message. And here it is, in a sense, all summed up in this one great phrase. You see the situation. You look at it, you examine it, you dissect it. You issue your reports on it. All right, it's all very good, it's descriptive. But the question is, what can be done? Is there any solution? Is there any hope? And from the standpoint of men, there is none at all. Then suddenly, what? And the answer is, God. God appears. And the whole situation is entirely changed. Well now, what can we do better this morning? What can we do better as we start again upon a period of ministry then look at this foundation and basis of our whole position. Nothing matters ultimately, but our knowledge of God and our relationship to him. I say that deliberately. Nothing matters ultimately. There is finally a position in which we shall all find ourselves, in which nothing at all will matter, but this one thing, God, our knowledge of him, our relationship to him. Life brings us all eventually to the position of Moses and the children of Israel. Sickness, accident, deathbed. And there we are. And there I say, there's only this one thing that matters. Our knowledge of God. But alas, this is the question about which there is so much confusion at this present time. Who is God? What is God like? How can God be known? Can he be known? This is the great tragedy of the world, of course, that the world doesn't know God. You remember our blessed Lord at the end of his life in his great high priestly prayer, one of the last things he said before going to the cross, he put it like this. O oh, righteous Father, the world hath not known me. And that is the whole trouble with the world. It all comes back to that. Of course, we see the different manifestations of that. We see the symptoms, but this is the disease. O oh, righteous Father, the world hath not known me. That's why you get lawlessness. That's why you get indiscipline. That's why you get all these Mounting problems of life and of society at the present time. This is the fundamental cause of trouble. The world doesn't know God and it goes astray in all its thinking and its conceptions concerning him. Well, here I say is the great question. Who is God? What is God? What's he like? Can he be known? How can he be known? And the answer to all that is given us in this great foundational statement. And that is why I say the statement uh, is repeated right through the Bible. You watch it, follow it, especially in the Old Testament. And you will see that it is one of those crucial statements. That's why God always uses it and applies it to himself. Very well then, let's consider what this means. And the first point we have to make, our less, but it's absolutely essential, is of course the negative one. Who is God? What is God like? Can I know God? Well, now, what's the answer to that question? Well, the first answer to that question is the famous answer that was given by Blaise Pascal. He is not the God of the philosophers. You remember that great Frenchman, brilliant mathematician Blaise Pascal, who lived 300 years ago. This brilliant thinker, this astonishing philosopher, he was a religious man and he was concerned about these problems. And he had thought much about these matters. And then on that famous occasion, he had that wonderful experience. He met God face to face. God revealed himself to him. And he put it on a bit of paper. 
which he pinned inside his inner garment, and there it was always with him, the light, the glory. And then he goes on to say, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, not of the philosophers. That's how he put it. And it is as essential today, if not more so, than it has ever been that we should start with this particular emphasis. What do I mean by that? Well, of course, what we mean by that is this, that God is not just some abstraction. What is your conception of God? How do people think of God? Isn't that the common way of thinking about him, that God is some sort of abstraction? Now, the philosophers, of course, have taught people to think like that. They talk about the uncaused cause. They talk about the absolute. They talk about ultimate reality. Today, the, fa the f favorite phrase is the ground of all being. Or as some of them will put it, wherever you find love, you find God. But all this is abstract, abstract. Then God becomes nothing but a kind of uh, abstraction. Now that's the God of the philosophers. And they talk about him and they write about him. And of course we all tend to do the same thing uh, by nature. We don't stop uh, to think. We don't consider the revelation. But our idea of God is of some vague, abstract something somewhere. And then, of course, it follows from that that they go on to say this, that God is uh, to be found and to be known, uh, if they, even that is possible, as the result of intellectual effort, as the result of reasoning and thinking and understanding and argumentation. You work out your definitions and you bring forward your descriptions, and so, as the result of your great thinking, you arrive out at this ultimate reality, this absolute, this great abstraction, which they call God. Now that, I think you'll agree, is, is the common idea with respect to God. That uh, the whole thing is, is vague and nebulous, and that it is only these great thinkers, the great philosophers, who can arrive at some adequate conception. And that is what they tell you, the ground of being, and so on. Well, now I say this great statement here teaches us surely once and forever that that is a completely false and wrong notion, and thank God it is. If that were true, well, then religion, the experience of God, would be the prerogative of only certain exceptional people, uh, very few in number, and the vast majority of us would be left in a condition of hopelessness and complete helplessness, but thank God it isn't true. God is not an abstraction. The God of the philosophers is non-existent. He's merely the projection of their own minds and their own thinking and their own meditations. That is not God. Well, what is God? Well, here's the answer. God is personal. I, I am. Now, this is the most blessed thing that one can never come to realize in this world of time. God is a person. God is essentially personal. He, he speaks like that. I am. God isn't mere force. He isn't mere energy. He isn't mere power. We all tend to think like that of God. Some great storehouse of power. Impersonal. People talk about fate. People even talk about divinity in that wrong sense. There is a divinity that shapes our ends. No, no. It's God, personal, I am, who shapes our ends. Not divinity, even. Although divinity is in another sense true of God. But as it is commonly used, it is not only misleading, it is actually wrong. God, I say, is not to be conceived of in any of those ways whatsoever. Still less is he to be conceived of. As the idols which men have made throughout the centuries and continue to make. Now, let me read to you the famous statement concerning the God of the idols, as it's put in the 115th Psalm, in order that we may get this contrast. Listen to the psalmist putting it. He says, uh, Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? Then he answers, But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. And listen, their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. 
They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes they have, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither they speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is every one that trusteth in them. O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and shield. Now there, you see, in, by contrast, we get this vital and important truth brought before us. That God is not merely something created by men, not like those idols. People called them God and they worshipped them and they took their offerings and their sacrifices to them. They built temples to them and they were highly religious people. But the point is that their gods have no being. They have no person, no personality. They're dead, they're dumb, they're lifeless, they're useless. They're made by men and they can do nothing at all. Now, isn't it easy for us by nature to conceive of God in one or the other of these false ways and manners? But here is the answer to it all. God is the living God. I am. This is the fundamental postulate. He lives. He is. He is the author of all being. He is essential being in and of himself. There is no life apart from him. He thinks. He speaks. He acts. Now, you will find running right through the Bible this great contrast which is always drawn between God and every conceivable form of idolatry whether it is the crude form of making a god or an idol out of gold or silver or out of wood, or whether it's your modern sophisticated philosopher talking about his absolute or the ground of all being. This is the, this is the great contrast. The living God. You remember Paul preaching in Thessalonica. And this is what he did. He reminds them in the first chapter of his first epistle to the Thessalonians after he'd been from there just a short while. He says, you know, everybody's talking about you and they bear record of what? Well, of how you turn from idols to serve the living and the true God. He's not only the true God in contradistinction to the false gods, the fatuity, the vacuity of the idols, but he's the living God. This is the thing. You see, those other gods, men made them, put them on a shelf, worshipped them, and then they had to carry them about. They could do nothing. They, they, they give them, as he says, hands and feet and eyes and noses and so on, but they're of no value to them. They can't do anything, and yet they worship them as gods. They're dead. They're dumb. They're useless. But God is the living God. Well, here, you see, is the whole message of the Bible. It starts off, in the beginning, God created. Now, that's personal. That's living. God created the whole cosmos. It is God who sustains it in his providence. This then is the great thing which we must always grasp, the thing that was brought out so clearly here on this occasion when Moses was there that afternoon looking after the sheep and expecting nothing at all, probably had given up thinking in utter despair, feeling the whole position was hopeless. Suddenly, God, this living God, appears and speaks and says, I am. Very well. We start by saying, therefore, that God is personal and living and acting. And that leads us to emphasize the fact that he is a God who reveals himself. No man by searching can find out God, says the Bible. It was when the world by wisdom knew not God that it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe, Paul reminds the Corinthians. Now, you see, that is the exact opposite of what people think today, that you arrive at a knowledge of God by your thinking, your understanding, your philosophizing, but you don't. It never has been done. It never can be done. This is the way, and thank God for it, this living God chooses and pleases to reveal himself. Now, he says here to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, I am the God of Isaac, and I am the God of Jacob. 
what he was telling him was this. I, I'm the God who appeared to Abraham, the founder of your nation, when he lived as a pagan in Ur of the Chaldees. I'm the God who appeared to him and spoke to him and led him out and told him that I was going to take him to a new country and that I was going to make of him a nation. I'm the same God. I revealed myself to Abraham. You read the accounts of that in the book of Genesis. It's most illuminating and most comforting as well as being most instructive. God revealed himself. He suddenly appears. He did exactly the same with Isaac and he did exactly the same with Jacob. You remember that night that Terrifying night in his experience when Jacob was escaping from the wrath of his brother Esau who was threatening to kill him and he has to run away from home and there he finds himself the first night absolutely isolated, no one with him not knowing where he was going he'd cut free from all the past and there he is and in utter weariness, physical weariness he puts himself down to rest and to sleep with nothing but a stone as his pillow and God the God of Peniel, the God of Jacob. God appeared to him, God spoke to him, God of Bethel rather. He appeared to him and spoke to him. Now, here then is a great principle. He's a God who reveals and manifests himself and shows himself to people. And he's a God who's only known as and to the extent to which he does reveal himself in that way. But, and this is the thing I really want to emphasize, this is where the comfort and the consolation of all this comes in. He is a God who can be met. He is a God who can be known. You don't merely read of about him and think about him and argue about him. He's not just some great force of power or abstraction. Because he's the living God and because he's personal, he can be met, he can be known. Here he is, he comes to Moses, he speaks to him, he addresses him, and Moses is able to speak to him. This, I say, is the very basis and foundation of the whole of our religion, the whole of our faith. We believe in and we worship a living God. We can speak to him. We can pray to him. We can go to him. We can meet with him. We can address him. We can take our burdens and our problems to him because he is this living God. Again, I commend to you to read the story of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob and see what they did when they were in terrible trouble. Once they'd met this living God in all their problems and perplexities, they know that they can go to him when all things seem against me, to drive me to despair. I know one gate is open. One ear will hear my prayer. You can't pray to an abstraction. You can't pray to the ground of all being. You can't pray to mere force or power. No, no. But you can pray to and speak to the living personal God. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. But, of course, there is something yet deeper in this. And we must emphasize this also. He is the God of the covenant. He is the God of the purpose. And that is why, ultimately, of course, that he describes himself in this particular way and manner, and particularly to Moses at this particular junction. He is the God of the covenant. Why does he say, I am the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob? Well, here is the answer. He is the God who has covenanted himself to do certain things. And here, you see, we get the whole basis and foundation of the Christian revelation and the Christian way of salvation. Now let me put it to you like this. There were men 200 years ago, and of course there are still such people, and I suppose we all of us by nature uh, tend to subscribe to this kind of view, people who were called deists. Now the deists believed in God. They believed in a personal God. They believed in a God who had created the whole universe, God the Creator. 
and they believed everything you may want to say about the power of God and the ability of God. But this is what they taught. They said that God, having made this world, had ceased to be interested in it from that point. They took up their famous illustration. They said God, in, in his relationship to this world, is similar to the relationship between a watchmaker and a watch. The watchmaker makes the watch. There's a lot of intricacy. He puts in all the wheels and the springs and everything else, and he puts in the balance and he winds it up. And then he puts it down and he's finished with it. He's made it, he's set it going, but he doesn't interfere with it. He isn't constantly doing something to that watch to keep it going. No, no, he's made it, he's put it down, there it is. It has to get on with it, as it were. Now, that was the God of the deists. And there are many people today who seem to think of God in that particular way and manner. But that, you see, is not the God of the Bible. It's not the God who appeared to Moses on this occasion. It's not the God of the burning bush. Listen, this is the answer to all that. And the Lord said in verse 7, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Now, my dear friends, that's the truth about God. Is that the God you know? Or is your God some abstraction? Or even the God of the deists who's made the world and then has left it? No, no, God, I say, is a God who is concerned about this world and about this life. I have seen I have heard, I have felt. This is God. He's essentially personal. And if we don't always think of him in this way as living and personal, I say we are not believing in the true and the living God. He is the God, in other words, of love and of mercy and of compassion. He is a God who knows all about us and is concerned about that. Listen to the psalmist putting it. In Psalm 103, he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. He has merely made us and then allowed us to get on with it and suffer as much as we like. He hasn't abandoned us. He is not indifferent to us. He's not impassive. No, no. Like as a father pitieth his children. So, that's it. Now, this is, I say, of vital importance. Or listen to a writer of a hymn putting it. Lord of all being, throned afar. Thy glory flames in sun and star, center and soul of every sphere. What if he'd stopped at that? Wouldn't we be feeling rather hopeless this morning? When you're crushed or defeated or cast down and feeling utterly hopeless. Would that help you? Would that be sufficient? It's true. He is the Lord of all being, throned afar. His glory is flaming this morning from the sun and the stars. It will appear in the moon. The heavens declare the glory of God. Oh, he's the center and soul of every sphere. Yet, to each loving heart, how near? That's the truth about God. He is the great and the eternal creator. But he is the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. He is a God who is full of tenderness and mercy and love and compassion. Oh, listen to these blessed words again. I have surely seen the affliction of my people. God is self-subsistent, he is self-existent. He doesn't need men. He has existed from all eternity. I am that I am. I am what I shall be. Uh, he is eternal uh, existence. Life in itself. But he says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrow. Here is the whole basis and foundation. This God who tells Moses that he need not be afraid. You're feeling hopeless, Moses. He said, I've been watching you. I've been watching you through these 40 years. I've known every time you've sat down in utter desolation of spirit. 
You've looked back at the former days. You've said, if only I hadn't dealt with that Egyptian as I did and killed him there and buried him in the sand. If only I'd controlled myself, I'd have never come to this and I could have been of some help to my people. But here it is, I've done it and I can't do anything. I'm reduced to this and the people are absolutely hopeless and it's getting worse. Moses, I've known all about it. I've seen you and I've seen my people. I've heard their cry. I've seen their groaning as the taskmasters have lashed them with their whips. I know. I've seen it all. I feel. I've had compassion. Now this, you see, is all a part of this great covenant teaching which you find in the Bible. God made the world, made it perfect. But men fell into sin, and there he is in trouble. Adam and Eve hiding behind the trees, frightened, alarmed. Suddenly, they hear the voice of the Lord walking in the garden, in the cool of the evening. What's happened? Oh, well, God has come down. He sees their misery. Oh, yes, he'd seen their sin, and he hated the sin. But he didn't turn his back upon them. He came down to them. He spoke to them. Yes, there were words of rebuke, threatened punishment which was put into operation, but the promise, God, reveals that he has a plan. He's concerned about this world. He's concerned to deliver it. He's concerned about redeeming a people for himself, and he is going to do so. I have seen the affliction of my people. Now, that's why he talks about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The original promise was given in Eden, but the great statement of the covenant is the one, of course, that was made to Abraham. In thee and in thy seed shall all the nations of the world be blessed. There's the covenant. God reveals a plan and a purpose. He pledges himself to it, to Abraham, in thee, in thy seed. Here is God covenanting himself to his people. And, of course, He revealed and repeated the same covenant to Isaac and he did exactly the same thing to Jacob. Now, Abraham had other children besides Isaac, you remember, but it was only to Isaac that this was repeated. That's why he says the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of the covenant, the God of the purpose, the God of the plan of redemption. So now when he appears here to Moses in this condition of utter desolation and hopelessness, At the backside of that mountain, God says to him, It's all right, I am the God of thy father. Yes, but beyond that, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. I am the covenant God. I am the God of the purpose, the plan of redemption. And he goes on to say this, of course, that because he has that plan and that purpose, he's the God who puts it into operation and will ever keep it in operation. So he goes on to say, I am come down. This is the very essence of this whole matter. I have said I will bring you up. I have come down. And he's come down, he says to Moses, in order that he may deliver the people out of this terrible state and condition in which they find themselves. And here, if you like, is a summary of the whole message of salvation, the glorious gospel which you find in the Bible and nowhere else. God is not the God of the philosophers. He's not there somewhere and you only try to arrive at some knowledge of him with your great brain. Not at all. He's the living God. He's the personal God. He's made all. He sustains all. Things go wrong. But he's interested. He has compassion. He comes down. He has his plan. He intervenes. He interrupts into the life. He does something. He saves. Here it is. Go, he says to Moses, say this to fare unto the people, lead them out. I'm going to bring them to a land that is flowing with milk and with honey. Now, this is the God, my dear friends, that you and I must know and must worship and must serve. And it's all summed up in that phrase, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. I'm the same one, he says to Moses, and I have now come to tell you about the further, the next step in my great plan and in my great purpose. And you go on through your Bible, look out for this description of God, and you'll find it. You remember Peter, after healing that lame man at the beautiful gate of the temple, 
And when the authorities came crowding together and everybody was filled with curiosity as to how these men had been healed, and Peter says, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath raised up his holy child Jesus. You see, it's always the same. And it has uh, continued ever since. So God is personal. And God is the God of the covenant. In other words, he's not only personal, but he cares. He has a heart. He feels. I have heard their cry. I know their sorrows. Everything you can postulate about a person and about personality, postulate it in God. It's all there. The heart of the eternal is most wondrously kind. Very well, but let me emphasize just one other thing before I close, and it's all here implicit in this great statement. He's a changeless God. I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Don't be in any doubt, he says to Moses, as to who I am. I am the God of those men, the God of your fathers. Now, remember this, that some 600 years have passed since the time of Abraham. 600 years. But God assures his servant Moses that he is still the same God. He doesn't change. Again, the 103rd Psalm puts it very perfectly. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts, and to the children of Israel. That was probably some 400 years after again, after Moses, I mean. Here it is a thousand years after Abraham, but you see, it's still the same God. This is the point that God wants to bring home to Moses. That he is the same God. He is the changeless God. It's all in the two words, I am. It is only God who can say that. I am. I am that I am, he says later on. But it's the same thing. This great name Jehovah. I shall be what I shall be. Yes, but that is because he is. He always was this. I am. It's an eternal I am. And it cannot change. It is the changeless, the everlasting It is the eternal God. God not only doesn't change, I'll go further. This is the glory of God. He cannot change. God cannot change. God cannot deny himself. God cannot be tempted with evil. God cannot lie. Those are all quotations from the scriptures. And God cannot change. Why? Well, because he is the father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning a thousand ages in his sight there's nothing a thousand years is but as one day and one day is as a thousand years isn't it good to realize this this morning that God is and ever will be as he always has been and he cannot change Change and decay in all around I see. O thou who changest not, abide with me. But not only is he a God who doesn't change and who cannot change, he doesn't forget his purpose. He doesn't forget his promise. He doesn't forget his covenant. Now he may appear to do so. To Moses there as a shepherd at the backside of the mountain. To the children of Israel groaning under the taskmasters down in Egypt. It appeared, of course, as if God had forgotten all about his covenant. It's all very well to make a great promise to a man like Abraham 600 years ago. But what of it? Where is the promise of God? Where is God? Look at this. Look at the position. Look at the facts. God appears at times to forget his purpose and his promise. But at the very moment when you think so, at the very depth of your dejection, he will come if you're his child and he'll say to you, I am the 
the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. I'm the God of the covenant. I'm still the same God, and the covenant still abides. It doesn't change at all. So he is simply reassuring Moses. I haven't abandoned you. I'm not unaware of what is happening to you. I have surely seen. I have heard. I know their sorrows. They are still my people in spite of what is happening to them now. And they are still a part of my purpose and my plan that, like myself, is changeless and absolute and eternal. And you can add to that this comforting thought, that circumstances cannot affect him. Circumstances can make no difference to him nor to the glory of his power. That's the comfort he gives Moses at this point. If God had spoken to Moses and had said, I'm very sorry and I'm going to see what I can do, it wouldn't have helped Moses. But God speaks to Moses and he says, go, speak to Pharaoh, speak to the people. But the thing's impossible. Who am I, says Moses? I'm no man to speak. And Pharaoh's got great power and he's got his great chariots and his horsemen and his great military power and prowess. Well, who am I? What are my people? Go, says God. And when God says go, he means I will be with you. And that's his promise. I will be with you. Say that I've sent you. The might of Pharaoh and all his pomp and glory and power means nothing to God whatsoever. He is the great Jehovah I am. He made everything out of nothing. It all depends upon him and upon the word of his power. So circumstances make no difference to God. And all this foolish talk about the 20th century and its knowledge is so laughable. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. What he has done, he can still do. Moses says God to him, I'm the God who brought Abraham out of the Chaldeans and gave him the land of Canaan. He'd got nothing, I gave him all. I'm the God of Isaac, same thing. I'm the God of Jacob. He went out penniless, he came back a great host. He very nearly lost that, he would have lost it because of the malignity of his father-in-law Laban, were it not that I was with him, and then Esau might have destroyed him, I was with him. I am the God of Abram, Isaac, and of Jacob. What I have done, I am still going to do, and I ever will do, until my plan and my purpose are complete. Now, I am just reminding you this morning of all this, my dear friends, the whole history of the church in the past proves the truth of this. God continued with his people in spite of all their failures and their rebellion and their grumbling. God continued his purpose. He seems to abandon them altogether and they're almost finished. God suddenly comes and on he goes until in the fullness of the times God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law. And he preached, he taught, he worked his miracles, he showed the power of the Godhead in his own person. But they took him in apparent weakness and crucified him and he died on a tree and was buried in a grave. It's finished. No, no, God raised him from the dead. And the whole subsequent history of the Christian church is but a demonstration of this great fundamental possibility. That God is the living God, the God of the covenant and the purpose, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob, the God who cannot change, the God who is all-powerful, the God who is above all circumstance and chance. And as the whole of the past history proves this, the present and the future will prove it even more. It's an evil Hour in the history of the Christian church. Small, despised, rejected, derided, dismissed. And the scoffers are still saying, in all their ancient arrogance, where is now your God? And there's only one answer to give them. Our God is in the heavens. And he is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He remains what he ever was, and his promises are ever sure, and his covenant is absolutely certain. 
Let the world deride or pity, I will glory in his shame. God moves in a mysterious way. He has wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea. He rides upon the storm. Listen, his purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet shall be the flower. My dear friends, do you know this God? He doesn't change. He cannot change. His love in time past forbids me to think he'll leave me at last in trouble to sink. He won't. He can't. He'd be denying himself. I am what I was to Abram, to Isaac, to Jacob. I'll be to you. Go on. Face the impossible. Walk through more than comfort, co conqueror. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Well, I want to leave you with a question. Do you know this God? Have you met him? Have you ever known this experience on the backside of the mountain? Tell me, my dear friends, has God interrupted into your life? That's what he did here, you see, with Moses. I'm not asking you about your philosophical notions about ultimate reality or the ground of all being. I'm not interested in such things. All I want to know is this. Have you ever met the living God? Do you know him? Has he spoken to you? Has he interrupted your life? Has he erupted into it? Has he changed everything for you? Is he a God to whom you can go with confidence and with assurance? Do you know the way to draw nigh unto him? Here, I say, is the one thing that matters in life. Oh, the danger of resting upon religion, upon observances. They're all right, but my dear friends, they're no substitute for the real thing. The essence of the whole biblical teaching is that God is. I am. He's personal. You go to him, and in Christ you say, Abba, Father, my Father, my God. Oh, the vital importance of knowing this. Oh, the comfort of knowing this. I say again, when all things seem against me to drive me to despair, I know one gate is open. One ear will hear my prayer. Do you know him, I ask? Can you say quite honestly, the God of Abram prays, who reigns enthroned above, ancient of everlasting days, and God of love. Jehovah, great I am, by earth and heaven confess, I bow and bless the sacred name forever bless. Listen, he by himself hath sworn. I on his earth depend. I shall on eagles' wings upborne to heaven ascend. I shall behold his face. I shall his power adore. And sing the wonders of his grace forevermore. Very well. Can you end by saying this thing? Hail Abraham's God and mine. I join the heavenly layers. O oh, might and majesty are thine. And endless praise. Abraham's God and mine. Let us sing that great hymn of Thomas Oliver's hymn number 12. The God of Abram prays in th who reigns enthroned above, ancient of everlasting days and God of love. Hymn number 12.
We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.